Well, welcome again. Uh, I want to say as well, happy Mother's Day. Uh, my name is Matt, and it's great to be with you all. I was thinking this week, um, if you were here last week, actually when Lisa was praying in the middle, uh, she mentioned, you know, some of us, we have big things going on, like illnesses, so God, we give those to you. Others of us have relational things or some difficulty, we give those things. And at the very end, and I was, I was right there, I was like, yeah, I can kind of check a lot of these boxes. She said, and then for some of us, it's just the daily grind of life. And for some reason, that was the one that like really hit me of just like, do you ever feel like life is just you trying to keep up all the time and just running around? And if you have kids and my kids are just now at that age, people warn me about where it's like you have to be in two places at the same time somehow. Um, and so it just, it, it's crazy. And then on top of that, this battle, and I think this is part of the tension that we feel of, um, there are things that are really important, like what we're instilling in our kids or our work or how we feel like we're supposed to use our gifts and our calling and to leverage those things where God's put us or whatever it is that's, that's really important that then gets overshadowed so much by, again, the urgency of daily life and the demands and it's just very difficult to keep perspective. And I want to look at a story uh, this morning. It's from the Old Testament, and it's actually one of my favorite stories and books. And so if you want to turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1, um, and we are going to be celebrating communion here at the end of our time, uh, so you can be preparing for that as well. So Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, if you're familiar with this story, and I know some of you are, um, hopefully this today is a good refresher. And for those of you who maybe haven't heard this story, uh, I think that you'll be surprised with how applicable, maybe even timely, something written 2,500 years ago is to right where we are today. I think one of the reasons why I like Nehemiah as a book and it's so accessible and relatable is it's actually written in first person. So it almost sounds like you're reading this guy's journal or like his diary, and he's talking about one of the, if not the most significant chain of events that happened in his whole life. Um, I, probably 20-some years ago, 22, 23 years ago, I read this book by a pastor, author named Andy Stanley called Visioneering, and the whole book is him walking through Nehemiah's life and his story, and it just had a profound impact on my life. Um, there's a point in the book where Stanley, he brings the whole thing down to a single verse. And this verse is just, it has stuck with me over the years. I've come back to it many times. Uh, and again, it's about keeping perspective, uh, especially when it's hard to see what really matters. So I want to give you some context here for that verse and uh, so it makes sense when we get to it. In roughly the 500s B.C., the city of Jerusalem was attacked by the Babylonians. Basically, they burn it to the ground. And in the, those events, most of the inhabitants of Jerusalem were taken away to exile in Babylon, hundreds of miles away, modern-day Iraq. Now, eventually, the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians. Meanwhile, the Jews are still there in exile, right? There was a change of power. The Persians relaxed the rules just a little bit. And so after 70 years of Jewish exile, the Persians allowed many of the Jews in captivity to return home. But because the exile had been 70 years at this point, that meant that there were these whole new generations of people, Jewish people born in exile who had never set foot in Jerusalem or their, their homeland. And so this return from exile, it actually didn't happen overnight. So this is a several decades long event. And gradually, many Jewish people migrated home to, to Judah, to Jerusalem. And they began to carve out a life in this place they'd only heard about from their parents or their grandparents. And then there were others who already had a life in Persia. Like that's all they'd ever known. And, or other places like that. And they stayed where they were. Well, our main character, Nehemiah, he comes in several decades after the return of exile or from exile had begun. And so after the big event, he's still in Persia where he's lived his whole life. Uh, he's actually a servant of the Persian king 
a guy named Artaxerxes. And Nehemiah had a pretty unique job. Does anybody know what it was? Cupbearer. Yeah. So his job as cupbearer to the Persian king, Artaxerxes, he would taste the king's wine to make sure it wasn't poison before he drank it. Only one way to find out, I guess. And so he's part, like part bartender, part like secret service, bodyguard, however that worked. So he's living his life. He's doing his job for the king. He gets word from his brother, from Nehemiah's brother, who had actually just went and visited Jerusalem, has now come back uh, with this report. And Nehemiah finds out from the, his brother and this entourage that the city of Jerusalem, years after the return from exile had begun, is still in ruins. The place is still a mess. They don't have any infrastructure. The people who've come back, they're basically camping out. They're basically living in Jerusalem like they're refugees, even though they're home. It's very likely that few of them, if any, remember what Jerusalem was like before it was destroyed. And so they're all just kind of drifting, unable to, to really pull it together. And so here's the report that they give to Nehemiah, and it's this report that sets in motion this whole chain of events that would dramatically change Nehemiah's life. These are his words in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. So they, my, my brothers in that group, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And so the capital, Jerusalem, is desolate. I mean, the, the great city of our king, David, is burned to the ground. What he finds is the massive, or hears about the, the wall around the city is still in a pile. And so Nehemiah hears about all this, and his response is to weep and to mourn. And he goes into this big prayer asking God to help him fix this mess. And so Nehemiah says, somebody has to do something about this. And that very quickly went to, maybe I am supposed to do something about this. And so after praying... Nehemiah goes to the king, to Artaxerxes, and basically asks the king for permission to leave his job, go all the way to Jerusalem, and to rebuild the wall around the city of Jerusalem. Now, Nehemiah knows, because he's heard the stories, that approaching the king like this, to make this kind of request, way out of line for him as cupbearer. He knows full well if he catches the king on an off mood or off day, all the king has to do is wave his hand and Nehemiah is executed. So he goes, he presents his request. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4, it says, The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. Mm -hmm. You get the sense that it was a short prayer. <laughs> help, God help. I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, Jerusalem, where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Miraculously, the king gives Nehemiah permission to begin this project. He gives Nehemiah the official letters and what he needs to have safe passage hundreds of miles away to Jerusalem. So Nehemiah shows up in Jerusalem for the first time in his life, accompanied by some of Artaxerxes' bodyguards who, and like official officers and cavalry. And so the Jewish people there, they're like, something is going on. Um, they see him ride into town, flanked by these, by these Persian officers and officials. They have no idea, though, what Nehemiah is planning. And so Nehemiah takes some time quietly surveys the damage, and he begins formulating his plan. Eventually, eventually he says to the people, in Nehemiah 2, verse 17, he says to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began 
this good work. Just a, a side note. That one of the themes that we see again and again throughout Scripture is that God usually works through people. That he doesn't rebuild this wall himself. Nehemiah doesn't say here, well, I prayed about it, and that's all I can do. No. And I think it's interesting. Nehemiah doesn't even claim that God told him to do this. He just hears the situation and can't help but respond. I do think it's safe to say that God gave Nehemiah this huge vision because anyone else would have dismissed it as completely impossible. And clearly God's hand was in it because Artaxerxes bizarrely was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Go for it. Um, So Nehemiah formulates his plan. He announces it. And the people rally around him. And so right away, there's all this momentum for Nehemiah. And he's got to be feeling pretty good at this point. Yes, they still have to do all the work. But it does seem that they have kind of blown past all the non-starters at the beginning. And they are moving. I mean, a few weeks before this, no one would have even considered this as a possibility. Now the project is underway. People are excited. They have a plan. It's going to be smooth sailing from here, right? Well, that is not exactly what happens. Because from this point on, Nehemiah faces one uphill struggle after another. He has one discouraging, disheartening setback after another. From this point on, it's nothing but a grind. And just the daily hassles and threats and distractions and criticisms. For starters, uh, there were some neighboring non-Jewish politicians who also happened to be living in the area. Uh, There were these two guys in particular, one named Sanballat and the other named Tobiah. When Sanballat and Tobiah got wind of Nehemiah's plan, they got upset. They get upset that someone would want to do good for the Israelites. Like, how dare anyone attempt such a thing? So look what it says in in chapter 2, verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. He goes on, he says, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? So as soon as they start this work, they have people mocking them. They're already beginning to falsely accuse Nehemiah of sedition of plotting some kind of rebellion or government takeover, which, of course, isn't true because Nehemiah had gone to the king in the first place. Remember that? And asked permission and got blessing. So it's all good. Nehemiah responds, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. And so they move forward with the construction. And the scope of this project is absolutely massive. Everyone has a role, all hands on deck. Everyone has a job. In chapter 4, this progresses pretty quickly. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, that's the land just to the north, he said, uh, Sanballat said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Are they really going to get the temple up and running again? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah, that's the other guy, the Ammonite, who was at his side said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. Which I guess was like a big insult. To me that sounds like, something a fourth grader would say, but like, that's a big trash talk, okay, in the Bible. So no sooner do they start, they're, they're met with criticism. What do you guys think you're doing? You're never going to accomplish this. There's no way you're going to be successful. And it's not just these two guys that are stirring up trouble. There's another army just kind of looking on, the army from Samaria, waiting to see which way this is going to tip and how it's going to play out. And they're being influenced by these troublemakers and on and on. Now, Nehemiah expected some criticism. He's an adult. He's not, he's bold, but he's not naive. 
And so he can hopefully handle this. Um, Nehemiah and the people, they ignore the criticism. They just keep on working. Um, This is a picture of when the wall's getting made fun of. Uh, Verse 6, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Halfway done. At this point, things begin to escalate very quickly. Those who were initially against him, who initially mocked Nehemiah for his crazy pipe dream, now start to realize he might actually be able to pull this off. Just a side note here. Um, I think one of the best ways to silence the critics in your life, instead of engaging always, instead of always arguing back, at least here, one good way to silence them is to keep your head down and just do the work. But that's actually enough to make most armchair critics go away. But Sanballat and Tobiah are not most people. Uh, The gloves come off and they take things up a notch in verse 7. When Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us, ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. So people are panicking. Their safety is now on the line. Their, the mockery is now legitimate death threats. And you get the sense it's starting to wear on Nehemiah. He's like, every time I turn around, somebody's showing up in a panic, you know, freaking out, afraid that we're going to get attacked as we work. So Nehemiah takes the threats really seriously. In verse 16, he says, from that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Verse 23, neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. So Nehemiah has half the people standing around as guards with bows, shields, swords, while the other half works. Even those who have to go out and carry supplies back in, Nehemiah says, carry their weapon in one hand and the materials in the other. Because of the possibility of attack, they're sleeping with their clothes on, ready for battle. So it's part construction crew, part army. I mean, they are on the clock 24-7 until the city is protected. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. So the wall is finished. They just, at this point, have to set the gates, and then they're done. And Nehemiah gets this invitation. The premise, I guess, being that Sanballat and Geshem and the rest of Nehemiah's enemies, they're inviting Nehemiah to sit down at a table with them and let's have a conversation. Let's see if we can work something out uh, and come to some kind of an agreement or negotiate. Do you know that feeling, that uneasy feeling that something's off? Something's not quite right about this. So Nehemiah knows. His gut reaction is, this is definitely a trap. He says, but they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Why should I stop now? Why should I come down? I love this image of Nehemiah 
reminding essentially himself and them of the significance of what he's doing. He says, I am completely focused on one thing and one thing only. I'm getting this wall and these gates finished. And so four times he has to give them the same answer. No way. But these guys aren't giving up, and they actually decide to play even more dirty. And it's hard for us to fully appreciate the predicament that they then put Nehemiah in. But I'm telling you, what they do next to Nehemiah, even the most resolute person would be tempted to waver at this point. Then, the fifth time, Sanballat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Why does Nehemiah mention that he gets an unsealed letter? It's a really important detail. Because back in those days, you'd get a letter, it'd have a wax seal. Upon receiving the letter, you would inspect the seal to make sure that it wasn't broken, because if it was, that meant somebody had had messed with it. Getting a letter that was unsealed, or in this case, more likely, never sealed in the first place. That's code for this. Nehemiah, you have no idea who read this letter on its way to you. It actually changed hands several times. And you know, people being people, there's no way to know who might have taken a quick peek along the way at what's inside. Nehemiah keeps reading. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now, this report will get back to the king, so come. Let us meet together. Maybe we can talk. Maybe we can work something out. I mean, they are, now they're not just spreading rumors about him that could hurt his reputation. Now they could get him killed. If this ends up getting back to King Artaxerxes that Nehemiah has set himself up as king, Nehemiah is a dead man. So given all this, Nehemiah, are you sure you don't want to talk? Maybe come down, take a little break. We can discuss this. Watch what he says. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. I'm not sure that's what he really said. But anyway, (laughs) they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for, for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. He writes back or responds, I am not letting you guys intimidate us. He sees the motive. They're just trying to scare us. They're just trying to distract us, get us off track, to make us lose heart. But we're this close. We're almost there. And so Nehemiah prays, God, don't let me lose my focus. Strengthen my hands so I can complete this task. God, I'll let you take care of my reputation. He trusts God. Then he gets back to work. And a few verses later, there's this amazing statement. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. The wall's done. Nehemiah's enemies lose their confidence. The city is protected. They can now go to work rebuilding the temple, rebuilding, restoring the city in all of Jerusalem. What a great story, huh? I want to go back to that single verse that's stuck with me all these years I mentioned at the beginning. Um, It's Nehemiah 6.3. And in most translations, except for the NIV for some reason, which is what we've been reading, most translations and the best really translation of what Nehemiah says here, that, that great line, he says, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Your story is different than Nehemiah's. God probably hasn't called you to rebuild a wall around an ancient city, or is that? None of us. Okay. That's actually part of our problem, is that oftentimes the work that God gives us to do isn't nearly as like immediate 
It's not nearly as like visible or tangible as a nice construction project. I mean, some of us, we're trying to raise kids, and the timeline is a lot longer than 52 days. And you don't always see the results, and we're trying to instill certain things in them and, and raise them to honor and to follow God and to make wise decisions. None of those results are immediate, those hope for results. It doesn't happen overnight. Along the way, there's distractions. Along the way, there's urgent things that are tempted to kind of override the important. Or maybe for you, um, you know, you're trying to handle a conflict or a difficult relationship in a God-honoring way. Or you're trying to make a difference through the gifts, through the work that God's given you. Or you're, you're attempting to make a, a positive impact, influence for Christ where you work or where you live. All of these things, all of these things that God's given us to do are very easy at times to get discouraged, to lose perspective, to give in to distraction or the criticism of others. Nehemiah, before he even begins the work, is surrounded by all these voices saying, who do you think you are? You're never going to succeed at this. You don't have what it takes. You're going to fail. But he keeps going. And four times, Nehemiah says, no, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. See, I think some of us perhaps need to memorize this and just remind ourselves every single day. I think his statement comes into play really in a, in a big time way for all of us. That no matter what it is God has given you to do, and I, I'm mostly talking about the small things, sooner or later, for all of us, there are times when we're tempted to give up, we're discouraged, we're distracted. There's times when we're all tempted to come down from that section that we're working on to do something else. These distractions for Nehemiah were often fairly sinister, and he was able to see that right away. The challenge for some of us is a lot of our distractions are other good things, again, at the expense of what we've been called to. Important things are sacrificed for urgent things. Back to what I said at the beginning, the daily grind of life is really, really hard on the important things. Because life is now. Bills are now. Crisis is now. It's so easy to say, well, the important things. We can get to those things later. Nehemiah, with all of his distractions, with all the criticism, with all the other opportunities that came up, he never lost sight of the end goal. I think it's likely that, that perhaps he had to constantly ask himself, what difference is this going to make? Like, what difference will it actually make if I stay here and I finish this, this job? And then the answer is it'll make a big difference. A finished wall would mean safety for Jerusalem, protection, families, business, repopulation of the, of the great city, restoration of the, of the temple worship. It matters that this is finished. And so he says, I'm doing a great work. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got to get back to it. And what happens is we get discouraged because we're not seeing the immediate results or we lose focus, we lose conviction or our sense of purpose. And I think it'd be helpful at times, maybe like Nehemiah, that perhaps we need to stop and we need to ask ourselves, okay, I know what's important. I don't always connect the dots. I don't always see the results. But coming back to what's important, am I making a difference? Or, or what difference does this make, rather? What difference does it make, moms, to pick up after your kids day after day, trying not to lose your patience? What difference does it make when there's those days when all you're trying to do is just survive until nap time? And you're so focused on what you're not good at or comparing yourself to someone else or focused on your weaknesses. When the truth is, you're making a bigger difference than you can actually know. You just can't see it all in the moment. It's asking ourselves, what difference will it make if I stick to my priorities or my convictions? If I stick to the things that I decided were right 
before the crisis hit, before things got really muddy, before doing the right thing was like up for debate. What difference will it make if I reach out to these people? What difference will it make if I wait for the right person? Yes, I'm lonely, and yes, there's inconveniences and when I, whatever, but what difference would it make if I don't settle in this area? Or maybe for you, you have something on your heart, a way that God has gifted you. It could be a ministry idea, a business idea, an opportunity to reach out or to serve or to make someone's life better. And you've set out and you're trying to do it and there's not this immediate groundswell of momentum pushing you along. It's actually really hard. And there's distraction and there's criticism. And perhaps you need to stop and, and say, you know what? Regardless of the results, I actually believe this is something God has called me and gifted me and given me the opportunity to do. It's something he's leading. I am doing a great work and I'm not gonna stop. I'm not gonna quit now. Maybe we should just repeat this. Let's do it, actually. Would you say this after me? I am doing a great work. And I cannot come down. Is there an area of your life, a relationship, moms, dads, coworkers, neighbors, where you need to remind yourself of that? I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Maybe it's tucking your kids in bed at night, and after a long, exhausting day that has drained you of all of your patience, and you're wondering if life will always be like this, maybe it's pausing to whisper under your breath, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. Or for you moms and dads who who work full time outside the house, when you're tempted to pick up the phone and to tell your spouse you're gonna be late again because you're working. Perhaps for you, it's looking at that picture on your desk and whispering, doing a great work, doing a great work. I cannot come down and standing up and grabbing your keys and heading out. Maybe for you, it's an area where you're trying to do the right thing even when no one's watching. Doing a great work work and I can't come down. Maybe for you, it's you've been working really hard to get out of debt or to get your finances right in order. And I just had this happen yesterday. I've worked really hard in the last year to get my money right and it's not been easy. And I've been making progress. And it's like, yes, I'm finally, okay, here we go. And what do I do? Where was I yesterday? At a motorcycle st- store, <laughs> talking to a guy about monthly payments. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It was just, but it's like, what am I am doing, Matt, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Or something God put on your heart to do, we remind ourselves. As we move into communion and wrap this up, um, there is a part of this I want to come back to in chapter 6 of Nehemiah, verse 16. It says, sorry, I couldn't read my own writing. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. So it wasn't just in our own strength. It wasn't just us gutting through or, you know, uh, being determined and that's it. We actually had God's help. And I just want to remind us as as we prepare for communion, Tyler, you can come up. Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. He keeps saying, remain in me, stay with me, stay close to me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so he's talking about the fruit of our lives. I think we can all be productive. We can all, quote, unquote, get things done apart from Jesus. But as far as the fruit that lasts, as far as focusing on what he wants us to focus on, we have to stay close to him. And so as we come to the table... Um, This morning, I guess that would be my challenge for you. How connected are you to to Jesus, to the vine, to the source? So that what comes out of you, not today, but over months, years, and decades, is the fruit that lasts, is the kind of impact that Jesus wants you to have in the lives of your family, your coworkers. Um, I think for, for us, again, a lot of times it's other good things. 
And it's only by staying close, connected to the vine, that we're able to discern the best that God has for us in our unique path, in our unique gifts. So would you stand with me and we'll pray. Be invited to come um, participate in communion. I want to invite our communion servers to come forward. We have stations around the room, um, in the front, and then in the back corners as well. And I'm going to pray and then invite you forward. You'll be invited to take a piece of bread and to dip it in the cup and participate that way. But let's pray. Father, we are surrounded all the time by by the urgent, by, for many of us, lots of good opportunities. And we're constantly having to make these choices. And Father, so often in the moment, it's very difficult to see uh, the important through all of the urgent that seems like it just has to be done right now. So Father, I pray that you would give us your perspective, that as we endeavor to stay close to you, to live with you, connected to you, connected to your presence, that we would hear the voice of our shepherd guiding us, directing us, our next steps. Father, I pray for all of my friends here in the the things that you have called us to do as parents, as friends, as bosses, as employees, as neighbors. Lord, help us to identify those things that you have put on our hearts to do and that you'd help us to be like Nehemiah with this resolve and this determination to stay focused. Lord, we can't do it without your strength. And so we ask for that. Lord, as we come to the table, we're thankful for Jesus, your life, your death, that you promise to always be with us, walking alongside of us. Strengthen our hands, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.